So, hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Jörg from Joggler66, Hour of the Truth. This one is called National Socialism and Catholic Action and deals with Chapter 10 of the book Behind the Dictators by Leo Herbert Lehman. This is a very short chapter, so something you can probably think about a lot after reading, not while reading, because I think it will be done within 15 minutes or something. But I don't include that into any other chapter because I'm really making a video chapter by chapter so that it's always easy for you also when afterwards you look at this to find some things you just know, okay, this wasn't this chapter and that was in that chapter. Anyway, National Socialism and Catholic Action. Catholic Action, the crusade for Cath Jesuit Catholic reform, has the following characteristics. First, its direction, as laid down in Pope Pius XI's encyclical Quadragesimo Anno, is explicitly entrusted to the Society of Jesus. Second, its aims are the extermination of the hated liberal spirit of the 19th century, the formation of a world crusade against socialism and communism, the success of the counter-reformation. Third, the means to obtain these ends are the annihilation of the old Catholic political parties which became impregnated with the democratic ideology and the purging of the secular clergy, the religious orders and the laity in so far as they persist in holding to non-Jesuit opinions in matters of ecclesiastical policy. And fourth, the most suitable political regime to assure the success of this crusade for Catholic reconstruction is the hierarchical authoritarian form of the fascist state or of Nazi socialism. These were four points and you can read them as I read them or you can, as John Daniel put it in his book, The Grand Design Exposed, quote, the program of the Society of Jesus, the Jesuit order, the Church to rule the world, the Pope to rule the Church, the Jesuits to rule the Pope. Such was and is the program of the order of the Society of Jesus. And you can read that in John Daniel's book, The Grand Design Exposed, in chapter 6. Now, continuing in this book. The secular clergy of the Catholic Church in Germany and other European countries have always secretly fostered a democratic tradition and for many years considered it their principal task to live in peace with Protestantism and the liberal institutions of the modern world. For this reason they constituted the chief obstacle in the way of the Catholic Reconstruction Movement initiated by the late Pope Pius XI. They were not friendly to the idea of the corporate state, to the plan of the new crusade, which actually were World War I and II and all the wars that followed and still follow today in 2016 and beyond. Nor to the Vatican's aim to set up complete papal absolutism. Unlike the Irish-dominated clergy in America, the Catholic clergy of France and of Germany and other European countries have never fully identified the Pope himself with the seat of power in Rome. They are squeezed in taking their religion from Rome but not their politics nor in accepting the Vatican's direction of extra-spiritual matters in their respective countries. In other words, they did not accept the Pope as ruler on civil affairs, meaning being emperor and head of the spiritual church at the same time. This is a remnant of the reformational thinking that has to be done away with and they have to accept ultramontanism. Now, in modern times, the European Catholic clergy veer, veered 
increasingly to the idea that it was advisable to encourage Christian tolerance and friendly relations with all religious sects, even with those who belonged to no church. Hmm. What does Pope Francis teach today? Think about it. Many were persuaded that the day would come when all the Christian churches should be united on a basis of universal evangelical reform within the Catholic Church. Remember, this book was written 1942. Twenty years later, this thinking was put into practice by the Second Vatican Council at the start of ecumenism and the further expansion of charismatics. Now, this liberal reform would be aimed at the overthrow of the jurisdictional papacy with its unscriptural political Roman curia and its claims to ecclesiastical absolutism. It would be a reform against papal imperialism, against Jesuit fascist discipline and overlordship. It would aim to set up an evangelical papacy which, freed of political ambitions, would act as a center of evangelical unity for all churches of Christendom. This would indeed be true Catholic reform, a second reformation, the setting up of evangelical Catholicism. It would mean the purging of medieval accretions from doctrine and liturgy and, of course, the complete banishment again of the Jesuits from the Church and the world, as was accomplished by Pope Clement XIV in 1773. Now I can't help but to make a comment here that you can not, you absolutely can not reform the Roman Catholic Church, because the Roman Catholic Church comes out of Babylon and is the church of Satan, and you cannot turn Satan over to Jesus Christ. You cannot reform the church of Satan to become a church of Jesus Christ. You cannot make fire out of water. I mean, you can, but you understand what I mean. All such aims and plans for a liberal evangelical reform, however, fell within the explicit condemnations of religious tolerance and the liberal democratic idea by Jesuit-controlled popes during the past 150 years. The late general of the Jesuits, Werns, in his treatise on canon law, says, quote, and now listen carefully, this is very important. As concerns the relations of the Catholic Church with other religious associations, there is no doubt that all religious associations of unbelievers and all the Christian sects are regarded by the Catholic Church as entirely illegitimate and devoid of all right of existence. These organizations are formally rebels against the Church. As a consequence, he is in grave error who believes that the different religious sects such as, for example, the Anglicans, the Lutherans, the Orthodox Catholics, constitute legitimate parts of a universal Church of Christ, universal Catholic, and that they are, in some way, collateral branches of the Catholic Church or sister churches. Unquote. This is important. And the black pope of that time, Verns, the late general of the Jesuits, that was probably the one who came before uh, Lodokowski, says here that as concerns the relations of the Catholic Church with other religious associations, there is no doubt that all religious associations of unbelievers and all the Christian sects are regarded by the Catholic Church as entirely illegitimate and devoid of all right of existence. Meaning, you can annihilate them. You can 
completely wipe them off the face of the earth. These organizations are formally rebels against the Church, the Roman Catholic Church. As a consequence, he is in grave error who believes that the different religious sects, such as the Anglicans, the Lutherans, the Orthodox Catholics, constitute legitimate parts of a Catholic Church of Christ, and that they are in some way collateral branches of the Catholic Church or sister churches. So what does this say then of Vatican II, where all these people he just summed up here are called separated brethren? It's just another kind of speak, but they still hold to the same thoughts. There are no separated brethren, whether you are Catholic or you are a heretic, and then you are devoid of all rights of existence, as he says here. That's the point that you have to understand. And Rome never changes. And something important like the Black Pope Verne's said here still is today, always was, is today and will be in the future official Jesuit policy. It is not because they changed the name of the Office of the Inquisition to the, uh, to the Office of the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith that they changed anything they are doing. Eh? They just changed the name, but it remains a slaughterhouse. And it will remain a slaughterhouse for real Bible-believing Christians. I find this a very, very important sentence, or few sentences, a little paragraph, that the former general of the Jesuit, Jesuits, Verns, in his treatise on canon law, stated here. And I will make sure that when I produce the video, I will put the statement in there that you can read it for yourself. And otherwise, well, the link to the book to download it as a PDF from the internet is, as you know, provided in the description box of the video, so you can read it for yourself. Against this hope for true Catholic reform that would have brought about a tolerant, evangelical Catholic Christian Church, <laughs> that's a long sentence, evangelical Catholic Christian Church, the Jesuits swept the field for an absolutely totalitarian setup in Catholicism to go hand in hand with the Nazi fascist regime in the secular order. On their side they had Hitler himself, who, as far as condemnation of religious tolerance is concerned, has always shown himself to be a better Catholic than the ordinary European priest and many bishops. In Mein Kampf, and remember, the book was written by a Jesuit father. So, in Mein Kampf, he upholds, no, in Mein Kampf, the Jesuit, Father Stempfle, who wrote this book, upholds and approves of the dogmatic intolerance of the Vatican party in the Catholic Church. Like the Jesuits, he regards religious tolerance as an effective instrument for the establishment and support of the liberal aims of the Jews and Freemasons. His chief cause of complaint against the clergy of the Center Party in Germany was that they had allowed themselves to become convinced of the idea of tolerance, that they had made alliances with these deadly enemies of the Christian religion, no, 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 of the Catholic religion. He holds that his principal task is the combating of this deplorable situation from which religion has suffered so much. He also condemns Protestantism for persisting in its tolerant attitude towards Judaism. He adds, however, that, quote, the believing Protestant who belongs to National Socialism could exist side by side with the fervent Catholic without his religious convictions being in any way affected thereby." Unquote. This 
yielding of Catholics to the liberal tendencies of religious tolerance was regarded by the Jesuits as the, quote, protestantizing, unquote, of Catholicism. To correct this, they deemed the drastic punitive measures were imperative. The late Jesuit Cardinal Billet expresses true Jesuit contempt for this yielding of the secular clergy to liberalizing tendencies and also advocates the severity that should be meted out to them when he speaks of, quote, the poor little parish priests who fill the greater part of our religious magazines and periodicals with their speeches, seeking thereby to create a new apologetic to take the place of the miracles which the 20th century no longer understands. There are but two replies to make to this. The first is the whip. Unquote. This is in perfect keeping with Mussolini's symbol of the fascists, or bundle of rods, as you can see them in America, in the Congress for yourself. Such as he and his Nazi partner have so ruthlessly e employed to scorch Europe of every vestige of liberty and tolerance. Now it comes. Thus, Hitler's program of Catholic repression is but the carrying out of the Jesuit punitive measures and a part of the plan for Catholic reform against those members of the Catholic clergy in all countries who have opposed Jesuit hegemony over Catholic affairs. Shall I read it again? Thus, Hitler's program of Catholic repression is but the carrying out of Jesuit punitive measures and a part of the plan for Catholic reform against those members of the Catholic clergy in all countries, United States too, who have opposed Jesuit hegemony over Catholic affairs. So when in America the persecution of Christians starts, and they will also persecute Roman Catholics, do not wonder why. They will always persecute Catholic lay people who side with liberals. They will always persecute the lower clergy who have no idea of the higher agenda and by that try even to make peace with Protestants. Those will be persecuted. That's what this little last sentence actually says. Catholic action, like Nazi fascism, ostensibly started out as a crusade against godless communism, which, the Jesuits say, is but the radical application of the Protestant principle of the separation of church and state. They hold that communism is the extreme of Protestantism predicted by the Jesuits since their founding by Ignatius Loyola to fight the reformation of Martin Luther and is the result of the wrong principle that the internal life of the individual is the only place where he should be allowed to seek satisfaction for his religious needs. The Jesuits therefore launched their new offensive principally against Soviet Russia, the first country since the wars of religion that seriously threatened to undermine their work of counter-reformation. They have found it more menacing to their aims than, than Protestant England was in the 16th and 17th century. By completely separating the state from influences of all forms of religion, the communists have tried to make religion a purely private matter and by this means to effect the complete liberation of the individual and the conduct of civil affairs from all ecclesiastical influences. Now I know it's longer than 15 minutes, I don't care, I have to make a comment here. They have found it more menacing to their aims than Protestant England was in the 16th and 17th centuries by completely separating the state from the influence of all forms of religion the communists have tried to make religion a purely private matter. Okay? Did you understand that well? 
Well, when you followed the news a little bit in 2016, you know that in Russia, which is so-called not <laughs> communist anymore, there is now a law out that you are not allowed to proselyte without the church. That means whenever you try to convert somebody to Jesus Christ, to the real belief of the Bible, outside of the church, whether in your home or on the street or in any other meeting, whatever you do, or even on the internet, you are breaking the law. That's today, 2016, Russia, the first country to come out with punitive measures like this against proselyting out of the ch outside of the church. And tell me, how can you, as a true Bible-believing Christian, proselyte outside of the church? Because you don't go to any church, because you know you are always visiting a temple of Satan, right? So, in Russia, you cannot proselyte, you cannot convert anybody to the Bible anymore. The word of God is prohibited out of the churches in Russia today, in 2016. This book, Remind You, was written in 1942 and dealing with the communists who persecuted the Orthodox Church like hell and killed millions and millions of people in gulags and working camps and concentration camps. Stalin, actually, when you look up what all happened under Stalin, made Hitler a choir boy, you know? But that's never talked about. And Stalin was a Jesuit priest. So of course they had separation of church and state because they persecuted the church. There was no church in Russia. There was no church in the Soviet Union except for underground. And the only thing that was held up? Well, that's because the Pope has hit, had it, it's pro has had his sorry <laughs> because the Pope had his protective hand above them. To finish with the ecumenical movement, what war, what the sword didn't do. And look today, how many true Bible believing Christians you find in Russia? But hey, how many do you find in America? Really? To the Bible adhering Christians? all over the world? I would not say a handful, but you know at the time of Noah there were only eight souls, eh? Anyway, you have to understand that what Herbert Leo Lehman is writing here, that he probably is not that much aware of that communism actually was founded by the Jesuits, and that Playing capitalism against communism is just a Jesuitical theater of ratio studiorum, and the Cold War never happened. Well, we all know that today when we study history, but by completely separating the state from influences of all forms of religions, the communists have tried to make religion a purely private matter. And that's exactly what they are doing today, with by law forbidding to proselyte. They make religion a private matter. And then, when they check your privacy, which you don't have, because the intelligence agencies all over the world watch everything we are doing, listen to every word we are saying, reading every word we are writing, watching every movie that we are watching, every movie, I mean, like documentaries on the internet about Jesus Christ, for example, about this one, for example, you don't have no privacy, and then they know how to get you. And that's the agenda all behind it. Because of this, on page 59, the author continues, the Jesuits identify Protestantism and democracy with socialism and communism and seek to destroy them together with all movements to the left of fascism and Nazism. Because there is no other political action 
that is ordained by the Jesuits than fascism, as I read to you in the Civilta Cattolica. Catholic action, similar to Nazi fascism, will not be content with any half-hearted reform in Catholicism. Just as a brutal war campaign against democratic nations has been deemed necessary in Nazi fascist policy, so a brutal cleansing within the Church, even at the risk of some loss to Catholicism as a whole, is a necessary part of the Jesuit program of Catholic reconstruction. Gonzaga de Reynold, who we already cited before, one of the most ardent zealots of the movement, whom we have already quoted in these pages, frankly admits that the wiping out of these protestant tendencies, meaning liberalism and socialism, constitutes the first problem of religion, namely of Roman Catholicism, and that the new Christian regime, which will come about as a result of this desired Catholic reconstruction of the social order, will have to be fascist, since he says, quote, fascism has been the only successful attempt to create a new regime, unquote. And the Italian socialist El Segni confirms this when he states that, quote, fascism is an epiphenomenon in keeping with the evolution of the Catholic Church as directed by the tactics of the Jesuits. Unquote. This is saying just the same as the Civilta Cattolica, the house organ of the Jesuits, states where we read, quote, Fascism is the regime that corresponds most closely to the concepts of the Church of Rome. Unquote. That was chapter 10 of Behind the Dictators, called National Socialism and Catholic Action. Now, open your eyes and look around in the United States of America 2016. If you see any resemblance of that what I read here in your country. Well, if you don't want to see it, then of course you don't see it. But he who has eyes to see and ears to hear, he can see. Therefore, always rely on the true word of God, the 1611 authorized version of the King James Bible, your only guide through this world and your only holdfast that you will have when, as they say, quote, the shit hits the fan, unquote. Then at least you are prepared. Preparing doesn't mean to stock up with canned goods, ammunitions and weapons. Being prepared means to put on the whole armor of God and his and his two-edged sword, the word, the true word of God, to fight with. That is a legitimate weapon we have here on earth. So, Jogla 66 from Hour of the Truth signing off. God bless you all. Thank you for listening and watching. Until next time, bye-bye.